Okay, Bonnie, <laughs> I have an ulterior motive. I have several ulterior motives for having this conversation with you. My first ulterior motive is people who are kinesthetically capable usually become athletes, dancers, uh, or acrobats. I feel that there is a completely new field for kinesthetically capable people where movement is the message and the messenger. And what I think of when I say that is the bee. When the bee finds a new hive, it does a dance. It goes to the former hive and does a dance and it's describing where the next hive is. And it does it by how the sun moves in the sky. So I feel that people who are kinesthetically capable are actually the revolutionaries. That they represent just the way there's an astronaut, I think there's a somonaut, a person who can move through, who is gifted, who can move through movement domains and do exactly what the uh, B does of that communicating through their movement capability, the, the mirror neurons are, are being stimulated of what the new terrain is. And so I'm very intrigued with your odyssey as a pioneer that I, I feel in movement as well as the enormous accomplishments you've made in terms of how we see the whole anatomical frame and the, all the physiology and all that. But it's the movement perception that I feel. I mean, I, it's hard for me to, I don't want to separate my categories of admiration. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to, I, so, but I'm very intrigued and I, and I wanted to track, as far as I know you, from the circus into you, your Eric Hawkins phase. I mean, how, you know, how did that go for you in relation to the development of the kind of perception that is really extraordinary that you're bringing into the world that I feel the, you know, the issue around that we have outer space, that we have inner space, and that it hasn't been categorized very well, and that the immensity of what it means to be a human being, and particularly at the kinesthetic sense. So I, 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 don't, I would like if you could take us on a kind of journey from your circus into the, how did that go in terms of, <laughs> hmm. Um, first of all, I'm very influenced by the circus. Okay, so I want to hear. Um, growing up, my dream was a house and a car. That was my fantasy. That's it. How about a dog? Other no dog. No. How about a husband? No, a house and a car. <laughs> Later, the husband and the children. When I met Len, I wanted 12 children. <laughs> One for each sign of the zodiac? <laughs> and then I dropped it to six and we had three. But, but I didn't originally dream of that. But I did dream of a house and a car. So for me, the impossible and the extraordinary of most people's fantasies was my reality. So... I was intimate with people who were doing the extraordinary as mm -hmm. an everyday occurrence. People who took their, at any moment in a day, they could die. Mm -hmm. And where was this? The Ringling Brothers. And where, where were you geographically? Um, well, my parents traveled and sometimes I traveled with them. This, and what did this, they do? The circus was six months on the road and then it was six months quiet. Um, my father was originally a farmer and coal miner. He was a coal miner, and he, his family were coal miners. 
So he escaped and went to Cal. He was in Ohio, and he went to California, came here, and joined a very small circus. I forget the name of it. I did have a program, and he was the popcorn concession man. He was early 20s. And then a lot of circuses were going under in the 30s, and Ringling Brothers, some of the other bigger circuses, were buying up the little ones to get the animals and the performers, and so his circus was bought up by Ringling Brothers. And then he became a... Um, a ticket seller, and then he became an advanced agent. So I was 15 when the big top closed, and they were having a lot of union problems, and they went indoors. And I was devastated. I was at camp that summer, devastated to hear they had closed the, the big top. So for me, it kind of, I was never interested in circus again. Mm. And my mother quit when I was eight, and they divorced, and just a lot, a lot there, and I was fostered some of the time. So it was a very interesting history there, but I don't have to go into all of it except that I was exposed to different cultures. Um, but that's very interesting, seeing the body in all of these really elaborate capabilities. And it was normal. You mm -hmm. see, it wasn't the extraordinary. I mean, um, yeah, it was just normal. Mm -hmm. So my mother, who was from New York, and left home at 15. They were very poor Jews. Oh, and you're she Jewish? Went on a, my mother's Jewish. I'm oh, really? Jewish. Oh, I actually didn't know that. Mm. And my father's mother is Quaker, so I have the combination. Oh. Very important combination. And my mother's people were cultural New York Jews. They were not religious Jews, mm -hmm. but the culture. Um, but at 15, she went out on the road to earn money because they were so poor, and she quit school in 10th grade and, and traveled. And she was on Broadway one day, and somebody asked what she was doing, and she said she uh, was between work, and they said, well, the circus is in town. So she said, yes. Yeah. So she went out. She was pretty. She was very, very talented. And um, she eventually did trapeze. She did Roman racing, where you race standing. What did she know about a horse? And she stood on two horses and three people. Oh, that. Uh -huh. Raced around. Yeah. And um, then she did trapeze till someone dropped her. They had the net. And she said she didn't want to do that anymore. And then she did some acrobatic things on a very high platform. She without didn't have any training? She was very, very movement. What was the word you said? Uh, kinesthetically gifted. That's what she was. Uh -huh. Wow, but she had no training, no ballet, no nothing? I think she must, she danced from when she was three. Oh, she she was earning money dancing. Oh, okay. And, so she had that. Okay. Yeah. I don't know exactly what the, how they did it mm -hmm. because, like, for a doll, they had these, she, she and her, my aunt had. Um, pipe cleaners with little cloth, and then her carriage was a shoebox with mm. a string. I mean, they were very poor. Um, but somehow she danced. She was good, and like maybe she, I don't know. I never actually asked her that, unfortunately. Um, so she met the popcorn guy. So she met, by then, he was a ticket seller, I think. And um, they were in their 20s, and... Anyway, there's a lot there, but I keep saying, but it's so rich to, it would take a lot to describe how kinesthetically marked I am. I mean, Gargantua was the gorilla and Toto, his wife, they were friends of mine. And I would, it was horrible. They were in a cage, you know, so small and uh, it was tragic, but I didn't know it was I knew deep down it was tragic, but it was a way of life, or the elephants, or the wild cats, or the, the kittens. I mean, or um, psychology I learned from um, Emmett Kelly. I don't mm, know if you know Emmett clown, Kelly. Sure. But because I was there, like when the circus was there, I would sit in the front of the middle section, and I can remember Emmett Kelly coming over and giving me a piece of his cabbage mm. and he was so deeply sad 
that touched my deep sadness because I was a very sad kind of I I was in this world that was so rich and so um, alive but alone Mm -hmm. so I'm so grateful and at the same time I was not a verbal environment at all Mm -hmm. that's just what I mean you know, you bathed in a bucket, you know, a little bucket, and everybody was nude, you know. It was... Okay, I want to stop right here. And see, I think it's so important that, because we're making this, this is archival footage for the next generations. Who would have had interviewed Isadora? Okay, so you're talking about the kinesthetic inspiration. You see, all these things happen in childhood, that we get the imprint in childhood of what, of what um, drives us throughout our whole lives. And so you're describing such an incredible picture of, of a virtuosity, fearless virtuosity, which very few of us have any ac- access to. And then also the animals and the... Um, the entrapment of the animal and the rapport and the clowns. I mean, of of a world that is so <sighs> immense in all of it. And and I mean, just sitting here for a moment and just really letting that sink in of how that how that picture imprinted this little girl who was sad and who felt alone. I mean, and who dreamed about a, a house and a car. <laughs> but it's interesting, no people were there. I mean, which is kind of interesting. But, you know, so I, I just think that that is just huge. Okay, so Emmett Kelly is giving you the piece of cabbage and he's very sad and he recognizes the sadness. So now take us up from there. I mean, that's just beautiful.